We are going to welcome on a wonderful open source creator, Amanda Lewandowski, who is one of my favorite person people to uh, quote when we're discussing all the ways that open source can exist, because Amanda does some incredible work creating open source perfumes. <laughs> so take it away, Amanda. That is so kind. I am such an Oshawa fangirl. I'll talk more about why when we get into Q&A, but just I'm so excited to be here and share a project with you. And I want to get started by talking about the aughts in Bushwick, Brooklyn, where I lived my 20s. Because for a stretch in the mid-aughts, it felt like every Brooklyn millennial kind of smelled the same. Attorneys and artists were leaving behind lingering trails of sandalwood and smoky leather in cocktail bars and subway cars. And the smell became kind of the signature scent of a lot of trendy boutiques that sold Sally Rooney's normal people alongside a very impressive away of colored clogs. An ode to the familiar fragrance went viral. And when a journalist joked that a Quinnipiac poll found that one in five respondents shared the same signature scent, it was eminently believable. Le Labo Centaur 33 quickly clinched the title of first iconic perfume of the aughts. Uh, and it really shows that perfume is a powerful art, but we rarely talk about perfume as a technology. And it's both. But like many arts and technologies, its secrets are closely held by a privileged few. In fact, by some counts, there are actually more astronauts than there are perfumers. And as critics have increasingly noted since 2020, the select perfumers often share similar backgrounds. And they're exactly what you might expect. The Western perfume industry prizes perfumers with elite pedigrees, which often precludes marginalized perfumers because the emphasis is on training in a small city outside of Paris called Grasse, France. Up until about 10 years ago, you were considered a diverse perfumer if you trained in Paris rather than Grasse. It also perpetuates exclusionary practices from erasing noses who develop perfumes, like Frank Vogel, who developed Santal 33, whose name does not appear on any of the marketing materials, to exoticizing non-Western cultures by characterizing some perfumes as oriental, which push marginalized perfumers into teaching perfumery themselves. But there's a catch. Teaching oneself through recreating and remixing existing fragrances, as you might do with any other art or technology, presents a different tech challenge. I had the privilege of interviewing American, British, and French perfume makers and my interviews revealed that intellectual property is playing a complicated role in perfumery. Specifically, some aspects of scents like colors and odors remain unsettled legally, but likely fall into the negative space left by trademark and copyright law. Others, like molecules and formulas, are protected by IP that rarely deters competitors, but effectively prevents aspiring perfumers like me and you from creating and sampling scents. Now, as we all know, the free culture movement addressed similar problems in other industries by championing creativity with limited or no IP, but the perfume industry has remained largely untouched. And when I was getting ready to go on research leave, I decided to take a perfume making class by perfumer and educator Saskia Wilson-Brown. And drawing on her work, my research and work suggest that perfumery is overdue for a transformation and one is emerging open source perfume. Just like with any other part of the open source movement, open source perfumes allow anybody to replicate or reimagine fragrances, which empowers aspiring perfume makers and the public to practice perfumery. And as I talk about, it's pretty simple. I figured out how to do it myself. Crafting an open source perfume requires releasing public operationalizable documentation about the scent, which hopefully sounds familiar, including its ingredients and where to purchase them. Existing open source licenses like CC BY feature terms that enable perfume makers to reject or limit IP rights in certain aspects of their perfumes. And for those seeking ways to share sense and signal commitment to democratizing perfumery, my work draws on my personal experience certifying perfumes to pioneer the use of open source hardware certification through Oshawa, which extends the open source ethos into tangible products, broadly card hardware, which I consider to include perfumery, and that includes additional infrastructure for forfeiting rights in branding, works, components, and know-how to share scents that are made to be sampled. Together, these powerful interven interventions can fuel fragrances that are free. Free to make, free to sample, and most importantly, free from gatekeeping. I believe that open perfume ought to be the next free culture frontier, and my work helps chart a course towards its expansion. And I hope that 
sounded interesting to you, it's the beginning of my article, Open Source Perfume, which came out last year. Um, and I was really delighted that the editors resonated with the piece and they actually invited me to come do a perfume making class at a law school, um, which I think was the first workshop of its kind in the country. Let me pull up a couple of other things. Okay. So do, do you have any questions before I keep going? Oh, thanks, Chipper Doodles. Okay. So I thought what would be really fun is if we could talk a little bit about some of the primary sources that I drew upon in this piece, particularly from marginalized perfumers, because I myself uh, am only marginalized in some ways. And I think that that diversity of perspectives illustrates the need for why we need open source hardware to be supporting perfumery. And so the first piece I'm going to share is a piece about sampling by Saskia Wilson Brown, who is the founder of Art and Olfaction in Los Angeles. Um, and she is really one of the pioneers of the open source perfume movement. And she did have a database on her open source scent culture website, which is affiliated with her organization that had some formulas that people could use and make freely, but it was a little bit tough to find and it hasn't been updated since 2018. So I wanted to continue her work by developing my own perfumes. Um, and really one of the things I wanted to do was to make sure that this was an inclusive practice that could be used by marginalized aspiring perfumers who would otherwise be pushed out of the industry. And I think that this piece from the cut um, really illustrates what marginalized perfumers are capable of doing within a very problematic industry. Tembe Denton Hurst's work on perfumery in general is excellent, but her interviews with these five black perfumers really informed a lot of the work I did in my piece. Another perfumer whose work was informa informational and instructional was Yash Han, who has been um, a vocal critic of the continued use of the perfume phrase oriental to describe certain woody, ambery phrases because of its roots in colonialism. So I think this little podcast slash transcript provides a little context for the critique as well as the need for better systems that are not governed by heritage perfume houses like YSL that choose to continue perpetrating um, those critical terms. Um, and so what I thought we could do is talk a little bit about my perfumes. Uh, I create perfumes inspired by the World Wide Web because I am, I should have said this at the top, um, I'm a law professor and a technology lawyer, um, and I'm also an artist on the side. And I started making my own perfumes uh, while I was on my research leave. And I realized that I could make them more widely available to the public by going back to a client that I'd worked for when I previously worked at my old job, the Open Source Hardware Association. And I wondered whether perfume was tech enough to be tech to be hardware. Um, and through my work, I realized that it was. It's tactile, it's creative, it's innovative, and it's art. It's all the things that open source hardware is about. Um, but we were able to flex the definition to be broadly inclusive of an industry that is rapidly growing among marginalized people and to create a space for them to learn this art on their own terms. And so I'm gonna drop in the chat all of my open source perfumes, which are available here. Um, all the documentation is cross posted on GitHub, which I just felt like was on brand for an Oshawa certified project because so many repositories are on GitHub. Um, but I also thought that it would be a good place for people to potentially stumble across this work through unusual search terms around IP um, and they may find something valuable uh, in creating their own perfumes. And so I thought that because open source perfume is a little bit less common of a hardware source, and I can say that I think that I'm still the only person who's ever certified open source hardware through Oshawa, which I'm hoping will change soon, maybe with you. Um, I wanted to show you a little bit about the perfume making process and then make a perfume with you. So the first thing I'm gonna do is talk to you a little bit about touch grass, which is one of my perfumes that's inspired by admonishing the extremely online to go outside and reconnect with nature. Um, and the first core note uh, is a little note called vetiver. This is a jar of ethically sourced Haitian vetiver from Perfumer's Apprentice. Here, I'll do it TikTok style. There we go. Um, and vetiver is a grassy note. It's a type of grass. It has a very grassy scent. So I thought that it would be the perfect heart note for touch grass. And for perfumes, there are three types of notes 
There are top notes, mid notes, or heart notes, and bass notes. And the heart notes are the ones that kind of sit in the middle, as you might guess. Um, and they both come through at the very beginning and they kind of ground toward the end and then they kind of fade in the background. Um, and vetiver is that heart note for touch grass. Um, and there are a couple of other notes. One of them is black pepper. And you'll see that the black pepper is in a slightly different container. Wow, this is so much harder than I thought. Black pepper is in a slightly different container. That's because this has been pre-diluted. When you're working with fragrance uh, materials, uh, they come in high concentrations from the provider, from the seller, and you have to dilute them yourself with what's called perfumer's alcohol, which is usually uh, 10 parts perfume material to 90 parts uh, perfumer's alcohol. Um, for some materials, you actually have to dilute more aggressively because they are so strong. The ones that I've encountered that are like that are particularly civet, which um, used to be derived from the butthole of a cat and is now ethically sourced synthetically. Um, Chanel number no. five, fun fact, was one of the last perfumes to use a real civet collected from cats. Uh, and the other one is cardamom, which if you've ever had a chai latte, you know has that beautiful spicy like fragrance to it. Um, but as a fragrance material, it's very powerful, and I have to store it separately from the rest of my materials. So let's start with that little hit of black pepper. We're going to do two drops of 10% dilution. And black pepper smells not exactly like you would think. Black pepper does have a little bit of spice to it, but it also has a hint of sweetness that's really nice and kind of calming and soothing in the same flavor as, in my opinion, lavender, but a little bit less aggressive and a little less sleepy time tea. The opposite direction is a little bit of bergamot, which is an Italian citrus. We're gonna use two drops of 10% dilution of Italian citrus, the bergamot. And bergamot is up. It is zippy, it is fresh, it is clean, and it provides a nice complement to the spice and grassiness of the vetiver and black pepper. Next up, we're gonna add a little bit of labdanum. We're gonna add three drops of 10% dilution. And labdanum is a funky, beautiful flower. Um, even if you are not a florals girly and you don't think you like floral perfume, you may still like the slight funk of labdanum because it has that florally note, but it also has the earthiness that you would consider with like a, a fresh flower growing in spring. And that earthiness comes through in another note in the fragrance, which is cedarwood. We're going to do three drops of 10% dilution cedarwood. And the cedarwood smells, as you might guess, very woody, um, but it also has a very earthy, grounding, really cozy scent to it that makes this feel very warm. Um, and I like that warming sensation in a lot of my fragrances. And the final note is also in that warming family. It's called Ambroxan. This is 10%. Um, you can't buy it this way anymore, but you can buy it pre-diluted, which means that they've already docked it down to a 10% concentration for you. So you aren't counting 100 drops um, to make your fragrance. Um, another thing to tell you about making fragrances is we work on tables of 10. This was something that I learned from perfume maker Joey Rosen, who um, is the co-founder of a new independent studio in Brooklyn called Hoax Perfume. Um, I have smelled their stuff. It is incredible, beautiful, gorgeous, 10 out of 10, woodware. Um, and he was explaining that if you work on a scale of 10, I'm a small scale independent perfumer working way outside the mainstream industry. So I hand pipette all of my dilutions and I hand pipette all of my fragrances. You can see my handy dandy pipette set right here. Um, but if you are a more advanced or a more commercial perfumer, you may be using um, things like beakers to measure out your formulas. And if you're doing it on a scale of 10, the conversion is very easy, right? Rather than doing two drops, you fill it to two milliliters. Rather than doing 10 drops, you fill it to 10 milliliters. Um, and that can make a couple things much easier. One, it scales. So if you are making perfumes for friends or colleagues, 
Uh, you can make them in batches, which I currently don't have the capacity to do. And obviously, if you're looking to sell them, you can make them uh, at a scale that's sustainable for you. Um, because I think one of the cool things about open source hardware is, yes, you're making everything available for free, but there are still people who would rather buy it from you than make it themselves, even if they could learn how. Um, and so if you choose to go that route as an aspiring or amateur perfumer, you can sell your fragrances as well. So I've let this mature for a little bit. We've got like a cute little glass, with a little cup on it. Where? There we go. There we go. What do we smell? What do we smell? Okay. So it smells like picnicking in a dry, warm breeze, maybe near the sea somewhere. Um, the vetiver really comes through. Normally, I would use a scent strip, but I put it in my box, and I don't have one, so I just sniffed from the from the little container. Um, you get those hints of black pepper that are a little less spicy than the hot takes of strangers online. And the leathery floral labdanum is something of a reminder to stop and smell the flowers. Go outside and give them a sniff. Um, telephone poles, which fuel communication, are often made from cedar, which is why that note is a piece of the fragrance. And you get those citrusy, those citrusy notes of bergamot to offer a bright natural pick-me-up from the darkness of browsing the web. And finally, ambroxan is a synthetic ambergris, which is another material common used in perfumery, um, which provides kind of a velvety mystery that's going to ask outlast maybe the web itself. So let's try it on and see what we think. Ooh, that's so nice. What you really notice on first is that it's going to smell different on every skin type. Um, and that's one of the beauties of perfume is that something that smells great on your aunt or your mom or your cousin or your dad or your grandfather or your partner uh, may not smell so great on you and vice versa. You may have beautiful blood that lots of things smell amazing on you that don't smell so good on other people. This one, I think, has a lot of notes that will come out differently on different people. You're always going to get that heart note of vetiver, but sometimes I have found that the bergamot comes out a little bit more. Um, and if you do like kind of a citrusy, um, bright perfume, I'm thinking of a lot of the scents that are popular at Sephora have that kind of citrusy vibe. You may really like this. And when you learn how to make it yourself, you may choose to up the bergamot, down the vetiver, down the cedar to really let that top note of citrusy goodness shine. Um, there are a couple of other perfumes. They are called World Wide Web, which was my first open source hardware certified perfume. I have another perfume called Search Engine that's kind of black pepper and Palo Santo smoky. I have one called Buddy List, which is inspired by waiting for your crush to log on to Instant Messenger after school. And I have a more recent scent called Blog, which is very inspired by that first box of incense you brought from your hometown mall's Hot Topic um, that what I made for a friend's wedding. Um, and I think what's fun about making fragrance is it's such a playground for creativity because there are rules, but they are meant to be broken. And I think that's really what makes it part of the open source hardware community and family is it draws on a lot of the themes of creativity that made open source hardware a movement and made it sustainable. Um, but it's doing it from a really different perspective involving very different players in a very different playground. Um, but I also would like to show you um, a little bit about how the sausage gets made, um, not to mix metaphors. But my studio is my kitchen table. I'm sitting there right now. Um, out one view, I have a view of the Washington Monument. Out another view, I have a view of the Capitol. Um, it's very DC um, and very beautiful, um, but it's a great place to work because I have tons of natural light and I have big high ceilings, which means that I'm not sort of boxing all these fumes in. So if you choose to make one of these perfumes for yourself, I really hope that you do it in a space that's light and airy and has really good ventilation and make sure that you have cleanup supplies on the back. And then I wore my glasses as my eye protection. If you do not wear glasses, I would encourage you to buy those like little plastic glasses from Amazon or a more ethical provider and pop those over your little eyeballs. Um, and where do I keep all my supplies? I keep them in the box they came in. This is all of my perfuming supplies other than the stuff that I've bought um, for actually making the perfume. But you can see, I'm gonna try to hold it up carefully. This is everything. 
Um, everything you need to make the six perfumes that I have open source hardware certified are available from Perfumer's Apprentice and you can fit them all in this tiny little box, um, which isn't quite portable because it doesn't close, um, but it doesn't take that much space in your closet. So if you're looking for a hobby that can be packed up and put away, uh, maybe open source perfume is your next frontier. Amazing. We loved that. We yes. love everything about open source perfume. It's such an incredible like area, the way you've been exploring it, the way you've been uh, like, I'm obsessed with the like kind of early 2000s, 90s internet nostalgia aspect mm -hmm. of your sense. It makes me so happy, <laughs> especially like the buddy list. I think one of the scent notes on buddy list is like the leather chair that like every <laughs> family seem to have in the computer room <laughs> or in my case remember computer room. hallway <laughs> i just had a hallway that was slightly larger my parents put a computer there so <laughs> yeah thank you so much for coming mm -hmm. on and telling us all about these we're really excited to see what scents come down the pipeline and also thank you for really like we always say that any physical matter can be open source hardware, but I feel like you've really taken that to heart and you've really shown us the possibilities and like hopefully inspired other people who like, we, we love PCBs. We want all your PCB projects, but we also want to see everything else that people are making and like how we can be sharing and how we can like, you know, distribute knowledge. So really, really great to see this project and super happy to have you share it with us today. Awesome, thank you so much. And for those who are curious about other areas of the work that I do around um, open sourcing and creative ways to use intellectual property to serve justice, um, I'm dropping some of my scholarship in the chat. I do a lot of work around AI and other secret surveillance technologies. So if you did not get your IP itch scratched, <laughs> I have a place for you to go. Amazing, thank you so much. We'll make sure all of the links you mentioned get distributed to everyone watching and thank you so much. Have Thank a great you so afternoon. Much for having me. This was such a blast. Have a great one. <laughs> Bye, Amanda. Bye. Bye.